Hi everyone um, and welcome to our first event of The Big Conversation. Welcome to Southampton University's Christian Union, The Big Conversation. And this is our pre-Events Week talk and we are going to be having a conversation with professionals in science. And we are very glad to welcome Steph and Cara who are going to be chatting with me this evening. Um, so a big conversation is our events week next week and we're going to be looking at topics like science, um, for example, this evening and next week as well, and many more and have some interesting discussions um, all about that. So I think, Josh, are you going to um, present a video now about the big conversation? So yeah, that starts next week. Um, so please keep an eye out for that and I'll talk more about it at the end and how you can find out more. Um, so yeah, I guess we'll just get on with this evening. Um, so Cara, do you wanna first introduce yourself, talk about who you are, your life, your education, career, go for it. Wow, okay, short conversation. Um, firstly, thanks for having me. It's been a while since I've been able to speak to real people um, who I don't know. <laughs> so I hope it's okay, but apologies if I stumble a bit. Um, I'm Cara. In summary, I'm a South African, uh, born and bred. Um, I'm a Christian and I'm going to go ahead and call myself a conservation scientist. Although at the moment I'm working more in science communication uh, than practical conservation or research. Um, but that's very much where my heart is. Uh, so it's woven kind of throughout all the science communication work that I do, um, as is religion, which is really cool because I'm lucky enough to work at the Faraday Institute uh, for Science and Religion in Cambridge. Um, and I'm currently on the youth and schools team. So, well, today I actually spent, <laughs> I spent the day traipsing around a nature reserve, uh, filming some climate change content for a church, <laughs> for the kids' um, church. So it's fun. Um, I love it. Um, after, do you want me to go into education? Well, I can go for it. Okay. Well, after my gap year, I made a beeline for Cape Town uh, to study marine biology and oceanography at the University of Cape Town. And I loved every second. Um, so I suppose Cape Town is my happy place. Um, although I've been fortunate to work and travel in a few different countries, which we can talk about uh, later if you'd like. One of the countries that's kind of pretty big landmark in my career so far is the Maldives, uh, where I and my now husband ran a marine conservation, turtle rehabilitation and educational program. Um, on a local island, so don't think resort, <laughs> although who needs a resort when the ocean's that beautiful. Um, and then I started turning towards um, a science communication career after that, um, catalyzed by my first position at the Faraday Institute in 2015. Um, I remember when I was in South Africa and I saw the job advert, I was just really, um, well, kind of shocked and then curious and then really intrigued because we didn't really talk about science and religion together much. Um, in a meaningful or positive way um, up until then. So I certainly didn't feel qualified for the role, but I couldn't help um, applying. Um, so I got that and then I went elsewhere after that contract ended, but I've just returned um, and I couldn't be happier to be back. It's really peculiar to kind of stumble into a field you didn't even know existed um, and then just to have it fit so well. Um, of course, it's challenging, um, but I think it's the kind of challenging that I like and I suppose that I feel like I'll grow, I'll grow with. Um, if you've ever stood in front of like a hall of 11 year olds to 18 year olds and invited unrestricted questioning <laughs> about science, religion and anything in between, you'll probably understand the, the fear and the joy involved in that. Um, but the other but at the end of the day, it's really quite encouraging because if you create that space where they just feel safe and encouraged, they really ask some big questions, um, as I'm sure you will today as well. Um, so that's what I do. Um, although the day to day looks a bit different at the moment because we're not going into schools, um, but that's the gist of it. Yeah. 
Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, Scott, I kind of threw you in there. Um, but mentioning about questions, I forgot to mention at the start, um, <laughs> If you do want to send in questions, um, Josh will put a link in the chats of Facebook and YouTube. We are using this thing called Slido um, and you can just send in anything. Please feel free to ask us three, I guess. I'll try and answer some as well, maybe. Um, uh, any questions, so fire away guys, those who are watching. And yeah, Steph, do you wanna introduce yourself now as well? Yeah, so I am probably on the other end of the spectrum when it comes to my science specialism. So um, I'm a physicist and um, more specifically, acoustics is my background. Um, I studied physics and music at university at Cardiff, um, absolutely loved my degree course. Um, and I, I really like the application of physics to more than just what you stereotype, which is sort of engineering mathematics. Um, it, it was so creative to me exploring physics, uh, which is why I was so interested in doing physics with music um, as a degree. Um, I spent some time on research projects through the summer. Our university offered those placements. So um, I worked on a, an acoustics project with uh, the professor, professor, the supervisor who ended up supervising my final year project. And when I did my project, um, I had this real interest in, in, it annoyed me that physics was so badly taught to me at school and that um, I loved it and other people didn't get that physics was so incredible and amazing. So I um, chose to do an education based project, a bit like uh, you, you're doing Esther as well. And um, that was my opportunity in the first inkling I got um, that I wanted to express my love and amazement of science, which isn't necessarily what I had growing up, even though I started to see it at A-level and, and going forward. Um, then after that, I, I took a year out um, of university and I actually was an outdoor activity instructor uh, for Christian Youth Enterprises, if um, anyone knows that. It's not far from Southampton. Um, so I was one of the instructors there. And um, after that, spending so much time with kids and teenagers, I, I knew I wanted to go into teaching. So I went to the Institute of Education in London and trained to be a physics teacher. Um, and I was kind of noticed by the Institute of Physics there as well. So if any of you are physicists, um, I imagine a lot of you will know about the Institute of Physics um, and being um, maybe members with them as well. Um, so I, I did my teacher training um, and then I moved back to Cardiff after getting married and um, for two more years I was a physics teacher but I really had this sort of interest in kind of policy change and kind of radical change to edu education um, more than just uh, not that there's anything wrong with, with being a teacher um, but I just really had this passion for bringing science to everyone um, so I was really privileged and lucky enough to join the um, the Institute of Physics as an improving gender balance uh, coach. So I now work part-time doing that where I work with schools to uh, try and improve engagement of girls in physics, uh, but also uh, boys where they're underrepresented in English and, and languages predominantly. Um, and I also, after <laughs> that long-winded story, um, I also work for Christians in Science as well as the development officer, uh, which I largely work with students, graduates, um, early career scientists and um, I'm really passionate about supporting those working in science-based careers because it, it sometimes can feel maybe lonely, uh, maybe being the only Christian in the workplace, um, uh, but also there are challenges that you face. Um, there are moral, ethical, lo lots of issues that you can face in the workplace. So at Christians in Science, we really try to provide a network and support um, for anyone that's interested and loves science, but is also a Christian and wants to partner those two things together. Amazing. Thank you so much both for sharing that. Um, it's so awesome to hear kind of all the experiences that you've had and where you've worked and like you're both so young, but you've done so much already. And I think that's absolutely insane. Um, so thank you for sharing. So I guess um, kind of I'm trying to make this flow smoothly um, but we might just might just jump in kind of straight away with the the deep stuff um, I also forgot to mention sorry everyone listening that I'm a third year biomed student at Southampton University so I do have I wouldn't say I'm the most science 
face person but I I have some knowledge so hopefully I'm useful um so obviously you both like you've got degrees you're so well educated in both um science and um you both worked um looking at science and religion so do, how do you balance your scientific and religious views? Do you think sometimes they conflict or sometimes do they complement each other? I think that's kind of the big question, isn't it? Um, Cara, do you want to start? Yeah, thank you. Um, and it's a great question because I'll, I'll say up front that I don't believe they intrinsically um, conflict um, based on what they are and what they aim to do. But I think if I go through a story route, I maybe me and others kind of fell into a bit of a default um, going through my science career of not necessarily assuming conflict, but um, not really thinking about it. Um, so I think I navigated my science um, degree by putting God in a bit of a religion box uh, for quite a while. And then everything I was doing and everything I was learning into kind of a passion and a science box. Um, and it was left relatively unchallenged uh, for quite a long time because no one at church really spoke about science um, and no one to my knowledge in my course was a Christian. So we didn't really talk about religion. Um, as a quick side note, I now know that there were Christians. Um, so I'd like to, um, it's nice to suggest that we make ourselves gently and naturally known because I think we missed opportunities to encourage each other. Um, but thankfully it was actually quite a challenging and uncomfortable science and religion experience that forced me to think about what I thought. Um, in our postgraduate year, we were finally introduced to a philosophy of science module, which should come sooner, but it doesn't. Um, and looking back, this should have been like the positive turnaround moment, because I think if we, if we properly um, analyze kind of what science is and what it isn't, we, we already go some way to kind of breaking down those barriers or, or supposed conflicts that people think there are between science and religion. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't that kind of positive experience. It was actually quite uncomfortable um, as the lecturer took it upon himself to make Christians self-identify themselves by raising their hands, which in itself isn't an awful thing, but um, he did then proceed to to, to lecture us that week with um, some pretty targeted and <laughs> demeaning comments towards religion and the development of science, which now that I know philosophers is definitely not the way it had to be. It was just my experience of it. Um, and so I confess at that stage, that kind of pressure actually forced me to nail my colors to some Christianity over science masks um, in conversations with friends afterwards. And so I, I do get it this unfortunate tendency that we might have to kind of undermine science if we feel like it's um, threatening what we believe. Um, but I don't think that's what God would want us to do. And it's definitely not what he needs us to do. Um, and so thankfully that experience kind of drove me to find a book by Francis Collins uh, called The Language of God, which is written by a scientist um, and an atheist turned Christian. And it just presented um, a very intriguing model for kind of a positive um, relationship between science and faith uh, that took science seriously and took the Bible seriously. Um, and the book itself focuses on understanding evolution, but I think in so doing, it kind of hit on the fundamental differences between kind of the scientific mechanisms that um, he explained were being uncovered by science and also those kind of overarching layers of meaning um, that, that Christians find um, in the God that we believe kind of creates and sustains every, everything we're finding. Um, and, and not only that, kind of a God that encourages us to explore his world without being like a bit nervous about what we'll find. Um, and so that was, that was kind of a real moment for me. Um, and that, I mean, it didn't answer all my questions, but it presented this model, which just gave me the freedom to kind of power forward, um, understanding kind of the place for science and the place for religion. And so I suppose in that way, because we understand what they are and what they aren't, they don't have to interact. But as Christians who, who believe that God is the ultimate creator of everything, but also kind of personal and present, I think we can bring those things together within ourselves 
to find some kind of wonderful synergies um, between what we're finding in science and our relationship with God. Um, and I could probably give some examples, but I'll let uh, Steph, ah, I'll go for it. Um, so I suppose some examples <laughs> could maybe be like moments of worship, uh, which um, when we uncover something kind of amazing, um, which doesn't need to be there, but as Christians, we'll, we'll feel it. Um, or maybe post personal motivation um, for, for doing what we do in the first place. Um, or even I think moral foundations that, that can make us better scientists like scientific integrity or, or maybe humility to accept a, a paradigm shift, uh, which <laughs> most scientists don't like to do if it's their paradigm. Um, so yeah, I think there are great positive synergies, but it took me a while to kind of get to that stage, maybe because we don't talk about it a lot or we just don't think about it. Um, I kind of wish we could go back and do it again, but we'll move forward with that, with that positive feeling in mind, really. Yeah. Steph, do you, do you have much to say as well? Um, kind of yeah, well, what? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, I was, I was gonna say that I had, you know, I had quite a different experience to Cara. So I hope what I have to say is, is helpful for, for others who, who may have mm -hmm. sort of more of an experience that I had. Um, for me growing up there was there was no conflict um i was privileged and lucky and hate to say it but my mother was a physics teacher <laughs> so i i had that i had that um perspective quite early on um my dad had been an atheist um growing up and became a christian as well so in my family i had that kind of although I grew up in a Christian family, um, there was kind of exploration and that way of looking at things. Um, I also had a brilliant youth worker growing up um, who was a chemistry teacher. And so the way, the way we approached anything that of conflict between science and religion as a teenager was so wonderfully dealt with by, by this particular person. So I was incredibly lucky with that. Um, I'm going to I'm going to save the next bit for later on, um, but kind of because I'd been so empowered growing up that science and faith were so integrated and compatible. I, I went to university with this maybe naive um, confidence, um, mm. happy to, to share with my, you know, my friends that I made on my course and, uh, and otherwise that I was a Christian um and actually having that confidence in that place to say that I was the go-to person when people had questions and I it was I guess because of that confidence people felt able to ask questions that mm. they were worried would cause conflict but I guess maybe my personality or something people felt they could actually approach me and go why don't you swear or, or um, why are you choosing to be celibate till you're married? You know, those sorts of questions that they, they really want to ask and <laughs> scary question for some people among others. Um, I, I was sort of an approachable face that they could go to and ask. And I was a genuine friend to, to so many of them. Mm. That's kind of a, my approach when it came to, to university and um, it continues to be so I, I I've got, lots of atheist friends and that's really important to me um because i regularly get <laughs> questions one of one of my one of my best friends is a is a um reception teacher and she has to teach in a church of england school and i'm the go-to person that she has to go to when she has to plan an assembly on something to do with god but i'm, I'm that contact that that she now has we've known each other for seven years i pray every day that, you know she will discover God but um we can we can be such a witness to people wherever we go um and it doesn't require a church setting necessarily for that and that really links back to what Cara was, Cara was saying is that we um I, I truly believe that we are called into so many different places that isn't just church um to, to witness our, our faith and bring that to the work that we do praise God when we discover something new um, the way we approach things personally to different scenarios you know work is not easy and there are 
work politics, I've certainly had my fair share of really hard times, particularly as a teacher, that I really had to go to God about how do I deal with this decision where they're not Christians, so they don't get that this is necessarily wrong or unjust or whatever it is. Um, we, we need to be a beacon in, in those areas all over the world in all industries. So um, it, it, it is incredibly important that we and others who are interested in science and have faith believe that is a calling because it absolutely is. Oh, thank you. That's such good, like contrasting, but great answers. Thank you. And Cara, I was going to say, it sounds awesome to do a philosophy of science module. I would love to have done that. It was only a week. <laughs> <laughs> so awful I know and he asked us that whole self-identify thing on Monday or Tuesday and then he was like okay we'll address the religion thing um, although he put in the comments on Friday and it basically turned out to be like yeah a half a day um, of a little bit of academic bashing so not the best policy but I know the fact that you don't have to think about what science is deeply until a week in postgrad um, is a little bit unfortunate. <laughs> it kind of reminds me, there's a film similar to that exact experience you have from God's Not Dead. Um, I don't know if you've seen it. I've but seen there's it, yeah. Like, yeah, there's that exact moment in there. I think it is a, is it a philosophy class that I can't remember, but it's about getting called out, but kind of the conversation that happens between a lecturer and a student, it's really interesting. Um, but I was just going to share like a little bit about kind of my experience at uni. So I'm trying to have a little bit of input. Um, but kind of thinking about whether religion and science conflict each other. I've definitely, since being at uni, experienced both. Because um, like in my degree, obviously with physics and marine biology as well, the amount of detail you go into um, learning about how everything works to me is so insane it is unreal what happens within the human body specifically is what I look at mm. and um to me that just it inspires me so much to talk about my faith and think how how does this make sense to other people because I mm. I really want people to know kind of my understanding of this um but there's definitely also been moments I did a um module last year um looking at vertebrate development and it did com conflict with some things that I believed and it was quite difficult and um, kind of leading on to um, the next question, which Steph, you kind of talked about, there's politics within everything and there can be arguments as well. Um, within the module I had, I had people come up to me and challenge what I believed because um, they knew what I believed and then obviously things that we learned, they probably thought, oh, I wonder how Esther's dealing with understanding this or being mm. taught this so um have you ever had moments where colleagues um obviously within other areas and maybe within teaching or um the conservation that you've done Cara because within Christians and Science and the Faraday Institute you probably wouldn't have this but where um colleagues have kind of questioned um what you believe and how you're a scientist as well Cara mm. do you want to start yeah I mean the, the nice thing about working at the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion is that every time someone asks where you work, you get into the conversation, um, even if you're on a tube and <laughs> you don't know this person and you're like right under the armpit, it will happen. Um, so, yeah, it kind of happens a lot. Um, and whereas at the beginning, I might have been quite nervous. Um, now, uh, like Steph says, I just I do find it's an amazing opportunity um, just because I think the things that people come with initially um, are often misunderstandings. And so you can have quite a, a nice, um, hopefully civil, humble, gentle conversation about well, why do you think um, science says that? Um, and then based on what scientists are actually doing, do you think science can say there is no God? Or you can kind of push people into those, those areas where you feel a bit more solid because that's where the truth of the matter lies and that these are different sources of knowledge and they're trying to tell us different things. And I don't think many people think about it that way. And so I think the, with the general public, maybe that's where the conversation can go quite, quite nicely. Um, with other scientists, maybe there's a bit more emotion involved. 
um, so you have to be even gentler. But I think you can always approach it from a, a personal point of view, um, especially these days, people are very scared to <laughs> intrude on what other people believe. So you can just take the opportunity to tell your story and you can be, and you can say, um, well, Christians believe this, um, and so I see this interacting with my science in this way. And it's not the kind of interaction where, well, God says I'm not allowed to believe that. So I do have to throw away some data, but I'm okay with half the data. That's not where we get pushed to. Where we get pushed to is I do science because I love God. And, um, and what I find gives me more opportunity to worship him. Um, so I think personal stories are, are a great way way in depending on how well you know the person um, maybe you can go a bit deeper but um, I think that's a nice way to to take conflict um, perhaps yeah how about how about you Steph how do you feel about challenges I, I I find that we are we tend to stereotype the extremes in all religions or perspectives so when when we talk to someone that's an atheist we immediately are thinking in our head it's Richard Dawkins the absolute extreme and my experience of my atheist friends is incredible understanding they just don't believe in God and um, that can be the same um, for atheists speaking to a Christian they can have that perception that you are the absolute extreme you know what we don't want to be associated with um in the other direction so understanding perspective is is quite important um and that's very much how i approach my conversations but in all honesty and i don't know if it's because i work for christians in science i've actually had probably more experience um with battling christians <laughs> Okay. Working in science um, and by pursuing science and mm. those conversations are really interesting and just as important to have um, I, I actually find that for some scientists and many that I were maybe I'm you know very lucky to have had these experiences but I think it is scientifically reasonable to suggest there is a do the god it doesn't doesn't necessarily mean there is argumentatively proving it but scientifically being agnostic is in my opinion what everyone should be until you have some sort of certainty so that that's kind of the way I go about it when it comes to speaking with those that are atheist but um I I find the real challenge is when I want to share how incredible science is in declaring who God is and the perceived conflicts with the bible um, and I, I think that's an important point to sort of draw upon because you could argue that there are conflicts with what we understand about the, you know, the start of the universe and, you know, the, the six day creation that we hear about in Genesis. But for me, the Bible is absolutely true and declares who God is. The world <laughs> is absolutely true and declares what God is the problem it's me and my understanding so the way I have to approach things like creation and, and other things I have to be really careful and thoughtful about how I explore it so I you know I take both of those things as absolutely true and we are sinful we get things wrong so how can we try and explore those ideas um and I, I would really encourage people so, to surround yourself with people that you're comfortable exploring those ideas where you're not going to get shot down. So maybe in a group, you could have someone that, you know, absolutely believes in a six day creation and someone that absolutely believes um, in the, the universe coming into existence in the way that science currently declares. But if we can create a you know, a good environment to explore those things together that's not hostile, that could be really powerful. And um, as Christians, we need to role model that a little bit better sometimes. Um, so that's been my experience with science and faith um, and kind of the sort of criticism I have found comes from church, but that, that has been my personal experience and everyone's gonna have different experiences in that sense. 
think feeding off that, one of the one of the massive benefits I found when I first joined the Faraday Institute was just the the openness and the willing the the space to even ask a kind of heretical question because you actually you're exploring the different ways of thinking and these people that have been thinking about it for a long time kind of drawing on it even if it sounds so foreign mulling it over and say does that actually contradict what the bible says or does that just contradict what i've i've been thinking and kind of the visual aspect that i had in my brain already and so those safe spaces uh, where you're with maybe mature Christians who don't mind you asking heretical questions. You're not on trial. You're exploring things um, and who will pray about it with you afterwards and stuff is really valuable. So it'd be nice if we opened ourselves up to other people like that too. Yeah. Do you know what? The, the one question that always comes up when, when, when I have those sorts of discussions too is being in a safe enough space to ask the question, what, would it be like if there was no God? And you can look at that biblically, you could look at that scientifically, you know, if you can try and picture that and, and be in a safe enough space that that is not sort of blasphemous. I can, I can pose that question confident in my Christian faith, but start to consider maybe these sort of big challenges and these big, big ideas. And like Cara said, the Faraday Institute, Christians and science have been safe spaces for both of us to, be able to explore those genuine questions um, and there are far more out there than we would ever be able to answer or discuss today um, with you know those that have gone ahead of us and I'm sure Cara and I will eventually turn into those oldies and uh, <laughs> help the next help the next batch out um, but yeah find yourself a safe space where you can explore those because that has been certainly re rewarding for myself and Cara. Mm. And Steph, I just really liked, sorry, I just want to point out again, what you said about the Bible is, makes complete sense, true, and science makes complete sense. And the problem is our understanding. And I think that is just so important to also recognise when we talk about science and religion. Um, so I've just seen that we've got quite we've got a few questions on Slido. So I thought, cause we're like halfway through, it might be interesting to see um, what people have said. Sorry, you have to bear with me. I'm really bad at working screens. Um, okay, this one is actually aimed specifically at Cara, but they've specified that we can all put in a bit of input. Um, so Cara, um, to what extent do you think it is our responsibility or God's to look after the planet, after the planet which we inhabit? It's quite different from what we've talked about, but. No, it's a great question, yay. Um, I think massively, I think if you look throughout the Bible and you don't even have to go far, you can stop at Genesis, um, kind of the first command that God seems to give us is to be stewards um, of his creation. And I think the whole, way the bible unfolds after that shows us how much value um god puts in his creation um not just humans so i think yeah there's a massive call and i think at the beginning maybe christians were hotter on it and now it's gone to more kind of secular conservationists and we've taken a bit of a back seat because um because there are other things the church is doing and I'm not saying it should be top priority. I think usually when the church thinks about these things, it's like, Oh, we've got so much to prioritize. We can't fit on creation care. Um, but I don't think it has to be an item on a bullet list. I think it can be just part of our identity, part of the choices we make, um, part of what we pray about, part of what we speak about. And it can just naturally come from us because we love God and we will love what he loves. Um, and he he values and loves and thinks his creation is good. So I think it should flow out of us um, more naturally. And it's a great opportunity, again, to just um, have that out there. Because I think when I talk about Christianity and sustainability, um, people who um, are not Christians don't see how they're related at all. Um, and so we have a we have a great kind of ethical basis for wanting to protect um, the planet, which may be people without that sort of value framework don't have that sort of baseline justification. We've got such a strong one um, in the fact that we believe God created it um, and commanded us to, to be stewards of it. And I think 
also that kind of idea of ruling, which people usually point to that. They're like, but God said in Genesis, they will rule and ruling is bad because it's a tyrant. I think it's really help, a great opportunity to introduce people to Jesus and what God kind of means by an ideal ruler. Um, and so if we could truly rule uh, as Jesus ruled in the fact that he was humble and serving and caring for others, then that would kind of completely change the con conversation about what Christians mean uh, to rule um, over creation. So it's a great opportunity on so many levels. Um, whether the responsibility is ours or God's is kind of speaks into that, that um, part of our beliefs, which are hard to put into words in that we believe God is acting completely um, and utterly throughout everything and yet he asks us to be his hands and feet he asks us to um, and we pray it um, on earth as it is in heaven we we pray it and we believe that we should be part of that we don't sit back and wait for God to solve poverty we go out and we try and help as best we can and so it's that duality of yes God's in charge but he does ask us to be his hands and feet and witness. Um, so we hold both of those. If it goes wrong, I've spoken to lots of conservationists who, who feel a strong sense of despair when they've, when they've done absolutely everything humanly possible and yet their forest is still mined because finance trumps, then it's not a blame game. It's, it's an opportunity to kind of go to God and lament. And so we still have that, that connection. We like, God, this isn't the way it was supposed to be. Um, we're upset. We know you're probably upset, um, but it's not a guilt trip. It's an opportunity to share that with God and then move on and keep trying. Um, I hope that's helpful. No, that was such an amazing answer. Thank you. Um, we do have another question, which I can give to Steph because it kind of links on to the theme of creation. And someone has asked, how did you come to the decision about what you believe in issues such as creation? I think that sounds very, uh, it's a very good question. And I think a lot of us wrestle with that. And I think that's the point is a decision sounds like I've made a decision and I certainly haven't in, in all honesty. I think the best way to put it as all scientists should put it is that we have our best current theory. And I use theory quite strongly because we use it very flippantly nowadays. And theory is all that we have, we kind of put together and this is, <laughs> this is our best current model. But scientists should be uh, happy to change that. And we've seen that all this year. I think um, scientists have got a lot of stick for changing their minds. When they haven't, they've just got new information that means that different advice has been given. So the way I form my personal understanding of creation, um, and I say this very from a physicist's point of view, is... Um, it, oh, I think the Big Bang is incredible. And I look at the way that the Big Bang um, formed us from tiny, tiny quarks into protons, neutrons, electrons, and gravity over millions of years started to force these things together with such effort. Maybe I'm saying this very poetically, but that's how I see it, the effort. <laughs> to bring those together under enough pressure and gravity that fusion starts forcing them into brand new elements. And after another few billion years, uh, the star starts to expand to a, a red giant. It collapses and there's a supernova which makes iron, gold, platinum, all the most precious elements. And this tiny point over the far side of the universe in a galaxy among billions of galaxies called the Milky Way, there is this tiny planet, not very important, that just is able to have liquid water from the elements that is completely built from stars, building them billions of miles away from that supernova explosion. Um, I mean, I can put it even more poetically that we are literally made of stardust. I mean, all the elements in our bodies were made in the core of a star. That is mind blowing to me. So scientific explanation doesn't detract for me, it completely adds. But I have to then look at the creation story and go, well, how does that match up? And the way I look at things, and I try to do this as best as possible, is what, what's the important thing here? What, what is the Bible telling me? Is the, is the creation story, if you look at it in the way it's, it's written, is it telling me 
how we came into being or is it more important that God made us and loves us and the world is his and he created it that that's where I currently sit and like I said it's not a decision it's with the information I've got that's how I digest the information and I am open to be wrong I'm, I'm happy doing that I'm happy to say misunderstanding the science I might be misunderstanding the bible that might be a bit of a get out I might sound a bit like a politician there but um th that's that's important to me that I I almost don't pick a side but I I am picking what science is telling me but I can learn something from the creation story and and the bible too in that I am important I am valuable um I hope that answers the question, but if that person wants to get in contact, um, I'm very happy to sort of go into more depth um, with them on that if, if they'd like. Amazing. Yeah, it, we, we're we getting some more questions in. So obviously if we do run out of time, um, Steph and Cara have said they're happy to continue um, providing answers to your questions even after um, this evening. Um, I was just going to have another look. Sorry, it's quite <laughs> awkward trying to balance where I'm looking because um, we do have um, a couple more. Um, but I think it'd be interesting to look at science and the wider world. Um, so kind of linking on to future developments as well. Um, obviously, Cara, like you spoke about conservation and there's a lot of issues surrounding that as well and science is developing such incredible things and one of the huge questions at the moment is do you think that science can solve some of the world's problems sorry that's quite a big big question to <laughs> ask there's, there's <laughs> plenty of bringing off points um i think it is helpful to to think about what we think about science um so is science just a body of knowledge that we can pluck from in order to, to do things? Or is it a human endeavor um, that moves along really slowly and is prone to human interpretation or, or factors like where funding is coming from? And these kind of human decisions completely play into what is science. Um, and so I think it can for some things, if the, if the money is being directed there, the efforts being directed there, we can make strides um, and possibly strides open new technologies for greener energy and things like those are great that we can that we can harness to to say that we can use it to solve any and every problem I think over under overestimates um, what science is and underplays the human role in a lot of problems I mean could you imagine science solving poverty? Probably not, because there are just so many human elements that lead to the problems that we have. And the solution, unfortunately, is not going to be some nice science fix, like throwing all our garbage up into space and science will save the day and we can just keep doing our human things. I think science can come together with human will to do some fantastic things. Um, it can also come together with human will to do some awful things. Um, and so, yeah, science is a human endeavor. It's very much rooted in what humans want to do and are paid to do and can do. Um, but can it be this wonderful thing that swoops in and saves everything? I, I don't think so. Steph, do you have anything to add on to what Kyra said? I think she really hit the nail on the head. I mean, I, <laughs> I feel less in a position here to answer just because my background's physics. And I think a lot of those discussions really tend around biology and, you know, when does life begin and how do we look after, our, you know, our responsibility as humans. Um, but that just certainly doesn't uh, mean that I escape the question because I still need that person personal response in, in all of those things and there is that just sort of general life practice how do I carry myself in my workplace and with my colleagues at the Institute of Physics um, and how am I representing a Christian who is a scientist um, but yeah I certainly can't answer better than Cara just did. <laughs> now, everything you guys say is amazing um, so kind of again this might not have this might not flow as smoothly, but um, I actually watched um, 
a video today on the Faraday Institute website and um, looking at, um, I can't remember what the title was, but I do recommend going on the website. They've got some amazing resources. Um, and it was to do with science in the future and development, uh, particularly artificial intelligence. And I know this is quite random and it's not really any of our areas, but um, kind of thinking broadly with all of the advancements that are happening, um, again, this is quite a big question and Steph, I'll aim it at you first, if that's okay. Um, do you think that current scientific developments that are, that are happening threaten religion kind of maybe with, I know it's quite rogue, but the idea of um, humans being able to extend their capacity beyond their bodies and minds. Sorry, did that make sense? I was yeah, quite yeah, I think so. <laughs> Can do it. I think I think it's really important that we as Christians recognize that there are Christian scientists that work in those industries and I think the challenge for many of them is being vocal about it but if we are not present in those areas first of all we don't have an understanding of of what's actually going on so Important that we have Christian representatives that are working and understand what they're talking about um, and that is one privilege of working for Christians in Science that our network is many many leading scientists in all sorts of areas across the UK and the world who work in embryology and uh, you know astrophysics and artificial intelligence all of them are working in those fields and that's really important for educating the church in understanding what the science is because I think there can be a big fear of science um, and so it's important that we we take in those roles um, but also by being the present light in that field as well to bring that reason and that justification um, by showing that you know the, the collaboration of science and faith is is compatible and proving that that you need it and science certainly can't do things on its own and I would say most scientists would agree with that again I'm sorry to bring up the pandemic but the decisions that have had to be made by governments all over the world have said continuously we're following the science which actually annoys me as a scientist because you can't just follow the science you need to look at the economy and people's mental health and the, there are so many other factors be besides following the science what does that even mean because there are so many different elements of science that will contradict each other effectively that you know mental health does that outweigh you know the, the death toll and and, and so on so I certainly don't think um, religion is redundant in, in any of those. And I think most scientists that I've come across recognize that limitation and that need. But as Cara said, funding and money incentives is a big driving factor and um, that needs recognizing. And I guess reflecting on those barriers, which absolutely come up there are limitations to how much we can fight and drive things but you have to fight and drive things as much as God gives you the energy to do and then hand to God um, and I I certainly had that in my time where I fought and fought and nothing changed um, in, in a previous job and I was absolutely broken and exhausted at the end uh, to the point where I had to leave my job because it was just so I was so <laughs> done and now that situation is completely in my prayers and I have to just hand that over to God because I, I didn't have the energy to, to, to make those changes. Um, I feel like I've waffled there a little bit, but I hope that answered the question somewhat. Yeah, that, that was great, thank you. And Cara, do you have anything to add um, to what Steph has said or to the question? Not much. Probably. No, that's okay, that's absolutely <laughs> fine. Um, I think what you said, Steph, was um, really great. And so that was quite a rogue question, but I really appreciate you answering it, thank you. Um, just looking, because we've got 10 minutes-ish left, um, it might be great to go back to Slido, because we have a couple of questions that have a few, few likes, which means that people would like them to be answered. And um, reading through them, um, they are quite challenging, so if, a car and staff need a bit more time to think about it. Um, they will provide responses, just maybe not straight away. Um, 
<laughs> sorry um this is kind of um long as well so um this person has asked miracles are fairly unbelievable walking on water water to wine resurrection etc so how can christians believe in miracles and be rational thinking people um sorry i didn't direct that at anyone so I, i've please, got a response if go for it steph that would be one. great um I um, I remember being maybe 13 or 14 and stumbling across something on the Discovery Channel, which was um, a, a documentary series about scientific explanations for things that happened in the Old Testament. And I remember really distinctly it being about uh, the plagues of Egypt. Now, if you read sort of the plagues of Egypt, it, you know, it, how could, you know, how can all those sort of things happen back to back? And um, I, I watched <laughs> scientists theorizing how that potentially could have happened and historical kind of dates in which it could have happened. Um, uh, the, the one miracle in particular that, that seemed strange was about the firstborn children uh, of all the Egyptians dying as well. And um, through this kind of documentary, I was amazed at how scientists were able to come up with, not prove, but suggest reasonability behind some of these things, including the reason why uh, the, the firstborns all would have died because of a certain uh, order in which they ate their food in Egyptian culture and the firstborn was given more. And it, I mean, again, it was theorized, not proven, but it was exploring those ideas. Um, and in that moment to me, it was like, cool, we can explain God in a way. Um, I mean, it's not, that's maybe a loose way of putting it. But an another um, person I would really direct um, you towards is Sir Colin Humphreys, who is a brilliant researcher um, who looks at trying to scientifically explain biblical miracles. Um, and a really good job of that with the Old Testament, because um, I can't remember quite where it is, but there, there's a, a passage about the sun stopping. And he looks at the language of the passage and what uh, the culture at the time, some of those words might have meant. He looks at the date range in which that might have happened. And it comes to the point where there was an eclipse at the time, time frame that would have been with that king and, and, and so on. And he, he's not proving anything. But he's, he's, he's making <laughs> miracles seem reasonable. Now, that doesn't mean I, I don't believe in miracles and that science can always explain them. That, that, that's certainly not true. But I do think that there is, you know, as science develops, we are understanding more and more. And um, because of those explanations and understandings that we see in the Old Testament and even some in the New that, that people are beginning to suggest... Um, I, I don't think it's unreasonable for us to at some point say we could explain how this happened. Um, th th we might never be able to explain it as well. I put that disclaimer in too. But that to me, with all of the things going on in the Bible, reinforces to me the possibility of it being true. So that's one way of looking at it. Um, but the other way of looking at it from, I'll put my physics spin on this, is there is, I mean, quantum physics is mind blowing. I mean, I could go off on that trail of how quantum physics works is it, I was about to say, it's like rocket science, science but <laughs> that's not helpful. Um, it, it is really mind blowing. And <laughs> someone, someone put it to me once when I, again, when I was younger, that every time we discover something and are able to explain something, maybe something we have previously deemed miraculous, they imagine God's up in heaven going, oh, look at them, they've just worked out that bit. I can't wait for them to find out the next bit. And um, that made me realize and kind of gave me perspective. And again, many scientists will do this. They will say, there is so much we do not understand. So, I, I don't think it's unreasonable to believe in miracles because I think we could eventually explain them. Um, but 
the Bible also to me justifies that God can make miracles happen too. Um, so I, I'm not dismissing miracles that they will all be explained far from it. We can see from the Bible that the God that God is all powerful, um, but he sometimes works with his creation in the way that he's planned and made it and, and wants it to happen. I mean, if he's if the passage in the Old, uh, Old Testament where he stopped the sun and eclipse, he planned in the Big Bang. He just made it all work to those rules to make that happen and then carry on. And then something else happens is cool anyway. Um, but he he's also the almighty that can do what he wants I certainly can't tell him what to do I don't know if anyone else can so um he, he's he's not limited and we see that from the bible but explanations don't discredit him if anything to me it justifies what's being said in the bible more so sometimes so can I yeah mostly agree and then just add like a, an extra avenue as well like I think yeah like you said if there are explanations then sometimes they're miracles of timing like you said um, and that God's not necessarily breaking all the laws of, of science to make something happen, but by his foreknowledge is, is using amazing timing. Um, the other, I mean, the other side of the spectrum, the big miracle that Christians believe um, is our salvation is Jesus rising from the dead. So we don't want to go to the extent that we, we, <laughs> we as Christians um, don't believe that God can and will do absolutely everything necessary to bring us closer to him because he sent his son into the world, let him be killed and raised him from the dead, which is what the whole Bible kind of orientates itself yeah. around is that core miracle. And every, every Christian who's claiming um, to believe in, in Jesus Christ will, will believe that miracle. And I think it's very easy um, to think in terms of laws of science and how can God break them? And we think of, the universe as a closed system, which it generally is, um, but that assumption doesn't necessarily have to be true. It's what we found is that the universe is a closed system and generally when people die, they die. And so we can assume that when other people die, they will stay dead. And what God does with his miracles is prove that it's not a closed system. He's not part of creation. He's outside of it, but he can choose to intervene at times but he doesn't do it all the time to mess us up. He's not like, oh, I'm going to make Cara defy gravity now to really freak her out. He does it to point us to things. It's very intentional and it's always yeah. explained or, or awaited in the Bible. It's not random. Uh, he's not messing with the laws he's put in place, but he can and does point towards where he has the power to reverse them and do things that we we can't um he points to them he does them and that's kind of what we um base our faith around in, in many ways so just add that as well i like that i've heard that before um yeah that, that's that's a good thing for me to hear thanks <laughs> i think both those answers are absolutely amazing so i hope whoever answered asked that question i hope that what you guys said was encouraging and it answered it for them um I do realise that it's really getting close to half past, so we won't we won't go to any more questions now. Um, but for those who have asked questions and they haven't been answered, um, again, we will get them out to you um, either on our social media um, or we have a question a Christian Facebook page which you can find. Um, we might have an Instagram as well. I can't remember, but maybe just search it anyway. Um, so. I think obviously we'll bring this to a close um, because I mean, we could chat about this forever, couldn't we? There's just so yeah. much to talk about. Um, and I just want to thank you guys for your time today. You have been amazing. And I hope that everyone watching has been um, amazed and inspired by your answers and found everything interesting. Um, so obviously before we close, we're just going to talk about a few other things going on. So Steph, do you want to talk about the Christians and Science? Yes, I would absolutely love to. <laughs> so um, at Christians and Science, um, one thing we just want to share is that uh, we offer a year's free membership for students. You don't have to be in your first year. It's just your first year with us. Um, if you're already um, a member or have done that free year, it's only six pounds for all your other student years and it's reduced as a graduate as well. Um, so if you have not been part of Christians in Science before and you're interested uh, and you're a student, uh, which I'm assuming most of you 
uh, if not all of you are, um, then I would really recommend uh, signing up for free membership for a year. You'll get an email from me because I'm the development officer, so we can get chatting. Um, but the other thing I really want to point you towards is at the end of February, uh, the 26th, which is the Friday evening, and all day on the Saturday, we've got um, Coping with Controversy, um, our conference, which is for students, graduates, and early career scientists. And uh, we're gonna be exploring some big uh, topics, some challenges that uh, Christians, um, scientists can often struggle with, particularly, uh, it can be quite divided in the church as well. So we're gonna be looking at abortion, sexuality, and mental health. So uh, it's going to be an interesting, <laughs> an interesting conference. We've got some incredible speakers lined up that I'm really excited about. But our real focus is about creating a space and a dialogue where we can listen to different sides and try and find a uh, resolution um, in what will be, I'm sure, very different opinions going through the conference. Um, and also, if you sign up to that, it is, uh, there is a ticket you have to pay for, but if you're a free Christians and Science student member, it's only five pounds, and you get a really nice little goodie thing in the post from me that has chocolate in. So I would recommend signing up to that. <laughs> I'm sorry, Esther. <laughs> no, do not apologize. I'm definitely gonna sign up to that because it sounds <laughs> and it's, it sounds great so thank you thank you for sharing that Cara I can't remember whether you wanted to share anything no worries if not not in particular the Faraday Institute if you are interested does have a bunch of resources mostly multimedia past talks it can be a bit overwhelming actually but you can do a search for keywords you're interested in and see if there's anything there that's helpful or get yeah, it yeah I thought it was great going on there today I've been on there before because people watching might know of Professor Keith Fox. He's a lecturer at the university. I know you both know him. He's one of my favorite lecturers. He's um, the director. Um, so for those who know him, go check it out. It's a really great um, institution, lots of really cool things on there. Um, so just to close, um, I've just got to mention, so this is part of the big conversation, which is the Christian Union's events week, which begins next week. And as I said, just loads of talks, um, lunchtime, evening, um, discussing questions that everyone has about Christianity and life. God, anything you can think of, we're probably talking about it. So it's all going to be online and you can find all the details on our Facebook, um, our Instagram. It's all out there. So please come along. I hope this has encouraged you guys to um, think about joining. And we also have something new called Text to Treat. Um, it's a slight um, alteration on what we've done previously before COVID. Um, and basically, it's kind of just like this evening, you can ask any questions, obviously this evening was science based, but Text to Treat, you can ask anything, absolutely anything. And what we'll do is when we give you an answer, we will deliver a free treat. So it's a nice incentive to get asking those questions and we will answer them as best we can. So, that's pretty much it for this evening. And I hope um, everyone has found this really interesting and inspiring. And I just wanna thank Steph and Cara for their time. Uh, I think you guys have been absolutely brilliant and I have had a wonderful time chatting to you both and you've both been amazing. So thank you so much again. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So hopefully see you, see you guys next week if you pop along to um, other big conversation talk. So thank you for coming. Bye. Bye. <laughs> yeah, it's always <laughs> weird. You're like, do I wave? <laughs>